Hey guys, it's Alex and Dad from 7th Hour Films, back again with Doctor Who Classic. Last time on Doctor Who Classic, we had the first three parts of The Keys of Marinus. What all happened on that one? Well, they landed on a weird planet that's supposedly controlled by this machine that keeps everybody peaceful, but they have some alien frogman-type culture that's trying to take it over, so they've dispersed the keys, and now Doctor... Who and uh, the Doctor and Barbara and Ian and Susan are trying to uh, scour the planet, finding the other keys, so that, if I recall, aren't they going to put all the keys together to destroy it, so that the alien or the, yeah. the Vords, the Frogmen, can't have it? Right. Vaguely, that's what I basically remember. Yeah. And <laughs> along the way, we picked up Altus, the man with no pants that can't blink, <laughs> and uh, we also picked. Which up... is more disturbing, that he can't blink or he has no pants? Yeah. Uh, we also picked up um, the one girl, I don't remember her name, um, but the daughter of the guy that sent us on the quest. Um, and we've had, so far, a sea of acid, a kind of ancient Greek, ancient Roman mind-bending fantasy, and a jungle that's trying to kill them. Yes. <laughs> And we should be moving on to potentially a Doctor-only episode, oh. since he went off uh, further along on his own to find one of the keys. That's right. Um, so, who knows? Maybe maybe this will be a Doctor-only episode. That would, that'd be different. We haven't had that so far. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that is pretty much that. We're going to be watching the last three parts of this one, and I guess that's pretty much it. So, we might as well get right into this episode of Doctor Who Classic. Here we go. You can imagine what having a live fire on an indoor set, particularly their set, since we watched that 50th anniversary special, that must have been really difficult for them to put that in there. A difficult journey getting you back to the hut. Oh, we would have frozen to death. Ah, the wolves have eaten you first. Wolves? <laughs> yes, there are more than ever of them this winter. I don't know what to think, Barbara. I'll know more when, when and if I find Altos. And you know? Man, his costume oh, just keeps getting crazier. When you get <laughs> first Marco uh, Polo, now he's got fur. Well, thank you. Put a hat on. Wow. Well. I'll be back as soon as I can. You hear the wind howling, but when he opened the door, there was no snow blowing. Yeah. Well, I'll go and get us some food. We must fatten you up, eh? <laughs> well, that's specifically creepy. <laughs> oh. See, stock footage. Yeah. Absolutely certain they didn't bring a wolf into the studio. Well. Yeah. how a guy who lives miles from the village in a hut has metal spoons. How long do you think we'll last here without any fire? I suppose you're right. Come on then. Yeah, but there's no wind in here. That wasn't the way we came in. I'm there! She really is the warrior now. Don't look down. I gotta say, these caves are looking a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the three crusaders from uh, Indiana Jones. All right. Uh, have a nice trip there, Ian? I was going to say, you don't want to leave him there. He'll cut the bridge, but it seems like Ian already did that. Well, 
that was your own fault. Oh no, they're so fast. <laughs> Hard to swing a halberd when you're in a cave that's about as tall as you are. Yeah. Oh. I was waiting for the thud. Meanwhile, the doctor's been busy apparently. That happened. <laughs> well, the word that comes to mind is cheesy. No. I mean, it's a great idea, but obviously they were very rushed. Uh, the special effects, the ice cave didn't look real at all. The ice warriors, ice soldiers, uh, I yeah. looked like they were uh, not only dressed in medieval armor, but they were wearing shower curtains for capes. Well. Uh, so, uh, you know, and... The the rope bridge and putting ice across and Susan crawling across and reattaching it. Yeah. So how did the did did, did they, they do that or I was kind of thinking um, when they showed up at uh, the place at the end. It's like, well, how did they how did they get across? And uh, the guy Vassor would just be like, well, they must have jumped. It's like you can't jump that. It's like of course you can. You just jump. I'm surprised you guys didn't, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, the... Uh, it's just, you know, uh, it was a good idea, but sadly the very rushed special effects were were lacking. I mean... Sorely lacking. I mean, it's, it's kind of tricky to judge effects from television, British television... From 1964 at this point. But in the last episode with the living jungle, I mean, that was... I realize it's a lot easier to do that because you can you know make silk plants and stuff like that, and there's all sorts of ways to do that. But I just... I found the other episodes more entertaining and more compelling than this one. Yeah. Uh, not only is how did they get across, but how did they get across so quickly? Because... You know, Ian and Barbara and Susan and the other two had just barely got there when the ice soldiers showed up. So, I mean, yeah. that was a gap of only, what, three minutes maximum. So, are you telling me that the <laughs> semi-thawed-out ice warriors were able to cross over with, you know, one of them crosses over still in his armor and his, you know, shower curtain and rehook the bridge in under three minutes? It's It kind of stretches credulity. So, anyway. Yeah. I mean, great idea, poorly executed. I will say it's, it is interesting with this and with Marco Polo that they are changing up the the scenes, like the sets, every episode. Yeah. And granted, I would assume that for this one, they took their generic caves that they've had since, you know, uh, the first serial, and then they just dressed it up with the plastic to make it look like ice. Yeah. So, But if I recall correctly, wasn't... Uh, uh, Tomb of the Cybermen wasn't that like in ice, and they had they had a much better looking set for that than they did for this. True, but that's four seasons from now. The budget could have gone up by then. Mm, yeah, but uh, I don't know. Because which is also the same thing with New Doctor Who. Like if you go to the first uh, season with Christopher Eccleston, they have some of the cheesiest effects you will ever see. <laughs> yeah, this is 2005 CG yeah. on a very tight budget, but. <laughs> You keep going, the show gets more and more popular, so yeah. they keep increasing budget. We're still on the first season, so there's only so much they can do. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. 
kudos for trying, but... Yeah. As they say in the uh, carnival, close but no cigar. Nah. All right, let's move on. Part five. Oh, and notice again, uh, this was not a that, an episode where the Doctor was by himself. This was completely yeah. without the Doctor. Yeah, he's... He's, he's had a lot of those recently. Well, he had one in Marco Polo, and now these last two episodes uh, didn't have him. So, yeah, I guess guess he just had vacation days. So, so on this same planet, we've got ice cave knights from the Middle Ages and electronic bell alarms going off with glass cases and... Uh, Okay, this is Greece and Rome, a, a sea of acid. It's it's a very diverse planet. Uh, Aztec civilization in the middle of the jungle, or Mayan civilization, I guess. Well, who are you? My name is Terrell. He's clearly the I'm bad guy. The garden because he's you got the same well glove. Talk? I saw it in that glass case before someone hit me on the back of the head. While you're unconscious, my men searched the room. They searched you and the body of the guard. They didn't find it. Now, what did you do with it? I didn't do anything with it. I've told you all I know. All right. Ian is very done with this planet. Telephone. On your side, we're coming out. Hmm. You'll take my advice. You will find someone to speak for you at the tribunal. Do you know anybody in the city? Yes, I. I do know someone. If I can find him, who is he? Who? Hmm. He's a doctor. In a moment, I've got to go in there and face an accusation of murder. I need a man to defend me. I am that man. Okay. <laughs> Greek or Russian Orthodox. Perhaps, although inspiration for the Time Lords later on. Also, uh, somewhat ancient Israel. You look into the room, you see a body on the floor. What do you do, hmm? I'd see if I could help. I'll be first. Good. Right, now let's see you do it. There's a weapon beside the body. Do you examine it? Yes. Yes, I think I would. Good. Then you look up in front of you and you see exactly what you came here for. The micro key. And you are struck what? down so. Now, he can take what he came here for. The security guards and officials are on their way. So, <laughs> he decides to pretend that he is first on the scene. The relief guard! Yes. yes, of course! I can't improve at this very moment. I can't prove at this very moment that Chesterton didn't hide it in its present location. Oh. What do we do then? I have a little errand for you, and I think you would find it very, very interesting. This is the most fun the doctors had in this entire show. Where did you get it? It was given to me by the man who killed the guard. Is she here? Yes. Then please point him out to us. There, sitting in the front row. But she can't have found it up. Oops, you're making this too easy. All right, I'll tell you everything. I'm not in this alone. They made me do it. I'll tell you. Ah! I want to speak to Barbara Wright. Susan? Barbara, they made me call you. Who, Susan? Who? Barbara, listen to me. Susan? Susan? Are you there? Susan? They're going to kill me. Susan? Can you let that play? I want to see who the uh, head judge was. He looks familiar, you know. Mm. One of those probably great English character actors that I watched for years. Yeah. Man, that one that one went by a little faster. Yeah. Which is odd because it's such a static scene. You know, courtroom, there's Ian yeah. standing up, here's the prosecution, there's the defense, there's the judges. And yet it had a lot of a lot of you know, plot line and a lot of action. I mean with the bad guy getting zapped. I mean, in a full courtroom like that, how did they not see who zapped him? The only thing I could think of is there was that one guy who was sort of standing there next to him, 
and his yeah. blaster was on his belt, so the only thing I could think of is, still on his belt, he just angled it and shot him, and then it was like, you would think somebody would have seen that. You would think. <laughs> you, you'd think a lot of things about this yeah. trial, because... <laughs> There's a lot of shenanigans going on with this trial. Um, well, uh, you got to admit, though, that's an interesting uh, take. You know, you are guilty until proven innocent, which is literally the absolute opposite of you know uh, British and uh, and later, of course, American law and probably you know law pretty much everywhere. You know, the Code of Napoleon and and the rest of that. So yeah, it's it's interesting that they assume that he is guilty and he the burden of proof is on him to prove yeah. that he's not. Um, and I was thinking, like, oh, man, you know, this is the real interesting one, you know, not the, the ice one or uh, whatever else we've had. And it's like, oh, I kind of wish this was just, like, you know, more episodes. I'm like, well, I guess it is. I guess this will be feeding into part six. So, And then, of course, we have to get all the keys back to Albatross, Arbitron, whatever his name is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they've mentioned it a couple of times, but literally it's been now four episodes since we met the character. So Yeah. Interesting take on the telephone there, Susan? considering that in the vault room there was actual telephone. Susan? Well, Susan. but I'll have to live with the memory of his crime for the rest of my life. I'm sorry, but you see, you are our only help. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I do understand and I sympathize with you. You must have been sick with worry since you spoke to Susan, but I just can't help you. I know nothing. Carla said you must have been sick with worry since you spoke to Susan. Well, how did she know we'd spoken to Susan? We've told no one. Then Carla must have been with Susan when she telephoned. Yes. <gasps> let me go, let go of me. Let me go. Don't struggle. <laughs> I was kind of hoping Barbara would go all out again. <laughs> Start beating fools. Kicking some butt. club. Mm-hmm. It's the only way I could have gotten out of the room. time to leave. Well, yeah. Leave? But surely that stopped the execution now that Carla's confessed. I hope so. I sincerely hope so. Good news. Well, we stopped the execution because Carla confessed. Beeping clock. How annoying. That's just the added torture before you're executed. Carl and the prosecutor had planned to steal the key and sell it. And Chesterton here just happened to walk right into the middle of it. <laughs> that made him look so guilty, I never doubted for a moment that he was the one. <laughs> you should read Pillow, my boy. He founded skepticism. Great asset to your business. Well, <laughs> thank heaven you remembered reading Pirro, Doctor. Reading? What are you talking about? I met the man. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Please, I can out of the speaker. Show him. All right. Now. Black back crap again. Steady. Well. Go. Well, one of them might have waited for me. that time. However, I suppose I'd better join them. They left to take the key back t- to its inventor, Arbitan. Ah, uh, yes, back to the old <gasps> acid sea. It's been such a journey. So is the acid sea just over the whole planet, or is it just a sea? You hear me? I'm going to find out in the end. What have you done to Sabitha? <laughs> Trip over your frog he feet there, did you? Mm. He said he'd remove the force field. Yes, well, come along, come along. You're all running around here like a lot of scared chickens. We were waiting for you. But I'm here. My dear church, it's up here. I really, you drive me around the bend. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Well done, Doctor. I was afraid of this. Yes, and I think it's time now to go to, back to the ship. What about Sabitha and Aldor? Yes, they may be hiding somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Screwed. Right. We split up. <laughs> Susan, you come with me. We'll go in search of Arbiter. I, I don't understand you. We've done all these things for you. All you can think about is the key. Forgive me. The keys have filled my mind for so long. I've become insensitive to anything else. You know, his voice Peter is different. Is his head is enormous. <laughs> you realize it was <laughs> it. Kind of hard to get that off yeah. your horns there. Now, Ian did have a Can fake I key, didn't he? From a few episodes him? back? No. 
This is the genuine key. <laughs> My dear boy. We must go. Quickly, leave the building. Why? Yartek may put that false key into the machine at any moment. If he does, it will set the machine in motion. But once it feels the full force of the power, it'll, it'll break under the strain. You mean the machine will blow up? Yes, yes and coming. everything Come in on. this building with it. I still had some more monologue, but where you we can are. go. What do you mean about it? Come on, Barbara. <laughs> oh, that's so bad. And where's the sound effect? another temple next time I guess alrighty let's see who the bad guy was there boards alrighty okay that is Keys of Marinus. All right. Well, again, the uh, the trial episode probably the best of the six. Yeah. Uh, that last one, you know, have to wrap up all the loose ends. But yeah. <clears throat> uh, again, I don't want to say it's disappointing, but it certainly didn't live up to the rest of the previous episode. Yeah. <sighs> well, all in all, it. It was an interesting little journey we went on around this planet. Yeah. Um, I did. I do like that with this and with Marco Polo, they're they're really varying up the sets every episode. Yeah. Which is nice. Um, even if some of them are, you know, they're redressed caves <laughs> and stuff. Uh, I wish. Well, I'm hoping at some point we'll get through an entire series with no caves. Yeah. Yeah, because there were caves in Marco Polo. There were caves in, in the very first one. Yeah, there Definitely. were caves in the Daleks, too. And uh, technically there were no caves in the Edge of Destruction. No. But they were on the TARDIS the yeah. whole time. That was hardly a series. It was only two episodes. Yeah, I guess that's true. So, but I mean, like, if you've got the sets, you <laughs> might as well use them. So, and I imagine uh. with um, the the next one uh with that little tease at the end there we're going to another temple um i can only assume they're going to at least redress um this set uh this temple with the the keys and everything and they'll just redress that into the next temple isn't the next series called the aztecs so oh yeah it might be i'm pretty sure it um is. yep that's a solid that's just a four-parter we're gonna do that all at once yep okay Okay. That's interesting to find out. Are they going to do the uh, pre-Columbian Aztecs or, you know, after the arrival of Cortez and his men? That would be interesting. Yeah, maybe. Um, <clears throat> I almost feel like... I almost feel like if they were going to have Cortez, then the episode would be called Cortez because they did that with Marco Polo, but yeah. I don't know. Um, let's see. Right, so what do we got here? Well, the first thing I wrote down was the Trapper from Episode 4. An interesting character. And again, now, I understand that, you know, even in the world today, we have some Aboriginal tribes, uh, mostly in very uh, tropical sorts of places. It just seems kind of odd that in a place that has all this kind of technology and all this futuristic city, that there's still what appears to be, you know, a, a Trapper who lives up in the mountains, who makes his living you know, providing furs to the village. Yeah. <clears throat> so that was a bit of a stretch. Um, and and then the character, you know, is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? And he turns out to be a really kind of weak, wimp type guy, despite the fact that he seems very threatening. So yeah. that <clears throat> that didn't seem to be very consistent. Uh, uh, interesting character. The actor uh, who did it was very good. The, the yeah. nice little set there in the, in, the, uh, in the mountains was great. But uh, again... I suspect the storyline was somewhat rushed, yeah, uh, because his character development was all over the place. Yeah, I mean, I guess it makes sense, you know, when there's a bunch of them there. 
he can't really overtake all of them. But when it was just him and Barbara, I mean, this guy looks bigger than we are. So you would think he would be able to overpower Barbara. Yeah. Granted, from what we have learned in this set of six episodes, Barbara is apparently a warrior. <laughs> so maybe it's maybe it's unfair to say that he could overpower her. Now, so. in, in one of these episodes, didn't Ian say that he's the science teacher? So that means Barbara is the history teacher. Yes, she's the history teacher. He's the science teacher. All right. Which, yeah, for a while, I mean, they obviously said that in the first episode. It's been about two years since we watched the first episode. <laughs> so um, we have completely forgotten what jobs they had. Pardon our memories. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it is good to clarify. Hopefully we keep that in our memory now. Uh, it is good to clarify which one of them was which. So, um, let's see. I uh, wrote down the ice caves. Again, caves. Mm. I mean, they. It, it, it was at least like... It wasn't just caves. Because what they normally do with these caves is they just have the caves again. And they don't really do anything different to them to make them look different. You just have to believe, like, alright, they are in different caves than the ones that they have been showing since the first episode. At least here, they put on all the plastic and stuff to try to make it look like ice... And yet, while they were inside, they never once said anything about how cold it was. If you're inside of an ice cave, yeah. it's going to be very cold. The only thing was, um, when it first cut to um, Susan and... Sabitha. Sabitha, that was it. I was just thinking Arbitan. I was like, well, I got that name. So, uh, Sabitha. Um, and they said, you know, well, with what we're wearing, we can't... We wouldn't last an hour outside... And I think Sabitha said, like, well, how long are we going to last in here? And it's like, I mean, yeah, it's incredibly cold in an ice cavern, too, but there's no wind. I feel like that's got to be worth something. So. Now, there was one other, to me, inconsistency in the ice cave. The ice soldiers. Yes. All right. Does their costuming make us assume that they've been there for 600 years? Uh, you know, the, I've, I understand that they're frozen in place. Yeah. But... That seems, again, very inconsistent with the rest of everything that we saw. And, <laughs> oh, look, Ian, there's a pipe here with a valve that if we just happen to turn it, it's going to defrost the entire thing. Yeah, like, Why, I, I know, guess there was a pipe that was running in uh, hot water from what they said seemed to be some sort of volcanic spring that was nearby. And that melted not only the ice so that they could get the key, but I assume that then melted the ice soldiers so that they could get up and defend it. Which, again, seems to defeat the purpose. If you're going to hide the key in a block of ice guarded by four ice soldiers, why would you put, you know, in case of emergency, turn this valve right out in the open? Uh, well, yeah, because I was thinking, like, okay, the key is in a block of ice. Like, all right. Everyone, go get a ice pick. We're going to chip it out. Because if you do that, those soldiers aren't going to wake up. I guess what they're thinking is everyone is going to look at that valve and be like, oh, okay, this will warm everything up. And once it warms that up, then the soldiers will wake up and defend it. So Could be. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. You know, why wouldn't uh, yeah, Ian and uh, Atos uh, just take the halberds and start cracking open the ice block and, and take the yeah. key? So, yeah, it's, it was a little contrived. Uh, now, again, an idea of the keys frozen in ice, that's pretty cool. But, again, it just it's that was the cheesiest of the six episodes, I think, definitely. Yeah. And, yeah, we had the soldiers, medieval soldiers, which they just have weird civilizations here. We just have to, we just have to accept that, you know. Um, I guess. Which... Although, I don't know, because, you know, I was, I was going to say, it's like, okay, well, they have some sort of Greek or Roman civilization, but that was a trap, specifically, and, you know, Altos was not from there, he was from, uh, he was with Arbitan, and he got sent there, and so did Sabitha, so they just happened to, you know wind up in this place seems yeah. to be Greek or Roman, which I guess can explain the inconsistencies. And, you know, we also saw another point where, um, uh, in the jungle where there was also some sort of medieval knight there. So 
I guess that has to be the consistent thing, is that, okay, there was sort of a Middle Ages here, but the Greek or Roman thing, that was that was just all a trap, yeah. you know? So, so it... And then they move on to the city, so... Um, yeah, it's it, it it's very interesting what they mesh well, up. And again, you know, I, I don't object to there being different kinds of civilizations because, again, there are, you know, and I hate to use this term, you know, there's first world and second world and third world countries around our planet today. But you you rarely ever see, you know, a 21st century as opposed to a you know, 15th century type of civilization on the, on the same planet. So yeah. that's just, it's a little jarring to see that. Yeah, it, it is. It, it is odd. Um, I wrote down the trial. Um, so this whole thing, they were going to steal the microchip in order to sell it, and it just happened that Ian was there, so they were able to frame him. That that's a little odd. That they just he just happens to land there. So. But, uh, again, it does help them because the idea was that it was still going to go out in the mace. That was, again, the only thing that yeah. came out of the room that wasn't scanned. But it also, I assume, was a kind of a you know a blessing in disguise for them because now, instead of somebody actually investigating the theft of the key, they had somebody to pin it on, and once Ian had been executed, then you know they could get away with it. No one would right. have ever suspected that. Yeah. But they don't... They don't understand that Ian is going to then turn around and use his friends to defend himself and then ultimately yeah. get away with it. Um, which I did like that his first instinct is, okay, I need someone to represent me. His first instinct is the doctor. Which I'm glad, because, yeah, of all of them, I mean, you know, alright, you've got you've got Altos and Sabitha, we don't really know how good they are as lawyers, you have a history teacher and a teenage girl. It's like, yeah, I guess it does make the most sense to go to the doctor. Although I personally uh, would uh, have a lot to say about history teachers. Well, okay, if you were... Let's say you were in this, then. If you were Barbara the Warrior, could you defend Ian like... I mean, probably. It... it I don't know. It's... Well, I, I'm just saying, you know, yes, the doctor is the obvious choice there. Yeah. But uh, let's face it, you know, a lot of the work... Uh, Barbara came up with who actually, you know, yeah. figured, who she figured out that the woman couldn't have known that, that uh, they had talked to Susan. So That's you know. true. So anyway, just uh, another uh, kudos to history teachers around the world. We know yeah. what we're doing. I'm not trying to disrespect history teachers or anyone. I have a degree in history, too, <laughs> first of all. So, um, yeah, I just... I don't know, but it makes the most sense to go to the doctor yeah. as legal counsel. You have to assume he has. You have to assume that maybe one of his eighty thousand PhDs is. <laughs> I don't know. It's called doctor for a reason. Yes. So, juris doctor. Yeah. JD. That's what they call. That's what lawyers. That's the degree that lawyers get. Okay. The juris doctor. Um, and I wrote down the investigation, um, which was also interesting. Um. It didn't. I don't know. I I will say it's like I wish this has this that part had been expanded a bit because I feel like that was the more interesting like plot line we had. Like if that could have been expanded to one to another episode so that it could be maybe a bit more complex. I mean, it it was nice you know when the doctor was at the scene of the crime and he was going through everything and uh, he seemed to be having a lot of fun. But I I do kind of wish that had lasted longer. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, they could have pared down the uh, scene in the ice caves and added more time to that one. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I wrote down Carla. Uh, it, it is interesting that, you know, even like, okay, she confessed everything, but she confessed that it was Ian that did all this. It's like, that was like the third time it's that they were like, you know, this should be good. Ian's free, right? It's like, nope, it's this other thing. It's like, on the third time, I was like, oh my gosh, just let it be done. Uh, again, one uh, last little thread they didn't really tie up is that how did she shoot her husband? Because she didn't yeah, appear she, to have a weapon unless yeah. she reached it to the, like you said, to the guy next to her and, and just, you know, use that yeah. gun. Or if she reached to his gun and shot him with his own gun. I don't know. Yeah. 
Uh, interesting the talk about psychometrics there. That was probably just getting started uh, in the early 60s about, you know, how you can learn things other than just, you know, fingerprints at the scene. Yeah. Like, you know, the fact that you can tell whether the guy was hit from behind with the mace was either left-handed or right-handed, depending on the mark on the back of his head sort of thing. Yeah. So, forensic science is what we call it now, I guess. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. I did make sure to write down Barbara the Warrior, because <laughs> she really did, in these six episodes, she really did become the warrior of yeah. the group, which I would not have expected. Um, especially... Has Ian been in any fights in this? Well, the one with Marco Polo, which, of course, we didn't see. Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, yeah, other than that, I mean... And I guess, you know, they were all in sort of the fight against the Daleks uh, at the end. Uh, but yeah, Barbara Barbara going in, swinging, you know. She killed the she killed those aliens in the jar and stuff. She went against the, the trapper, so... Now, uh, now, one of the things, and this is, again, just very minor, you know, I... You know, I I understand what television is like and what you have to do. But have you noticed that what we are now, uh, six, are we six six uh, uh, series in, something like that? This is number five. Five, all right. So we're five, we've probably had maybe 25 episodes so far. Yeah. Somewhere around there. And yet Barbara and Susan's hair never changes. Now, no, they don't. You know from your mother that... <laughs> Her hair is never the same way twice, day after day. You know, it takes a lot for her to get her hair the way she likes it. And I understand it's television, but there is no way that's you know after being in the ice caves and then being in the yeah. jungle and all that. You know, you put mom in the jungle, her hair's going to poof out like a dandelion. You put her in the ice, it's going to fall flat. So it's just I look at that and go, it's just it's so. Yeah. Everything else that they're doing, you could at least mess up their hair once in a while. You know, let us see them. So that they're they, not, you know, TV. I mean, they occasionally do that to the doctor. Like, his hair has been a little crazy before, but yeah. that's about it. Um, yeah, you're right. Like, it's always seems... It's always the exact same shape. And it, it looks like it just cannot move. Well, we used to call that the hair helmet. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm sure she probably has some kind of, you know, industrial strength hairspray on it. But still, yeah. going from the jungle to the ice and everything else, no. I mean, she would... She would look like the Bride of Frankenstein uh, <laughs> yeah. by the end of that. Um, and it's also interesting with, you know, changing, you know, how they look. Ian is the only one to really change clothes now. Because he's still wearing the outfit that he wore in Marco Polo. Whereas, um, I maybe Barbara was wearing something, but I don't remember. But then she changed into the dress in episode two. And then she somehow, without returning to the TARDIS, immediately changed back into her sweater vest, or <laughs> her sweater that she had. Yeah. And the cowl neck sweater. Yeah, and then That's... she's she's just keeping that. And obviously, the Doctor is, you know, has the same outfit. But yeah. that's just a thing with the Doctor. He always wears the exact same outfit. Yeah. So, it yeah, I don't know. Um, the last thing I wrote down was the Vords. You know, when we got back to them, I was kind of thinking, oh yeah, them. They were the threat. We, I feel like we should have had them throughout the whole thing. Yeah, the, and again, for, you know, taking the mini-subs through the sea of acid and, you know, being this incredibly frightening-looking appearance, they turned out to be a bunch of wimps, you know. Yeah. Except for the one guy who tripped over his flipper. Huh? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I mean, sometimes... I mean, hey, in in the first Star Wars, there's that one stormtrooper that hits his head on the door, so... Yeah. And, I mean, it happens, and you can't go back, especially on here. You can't you, go back and You probably and remember from uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space, when they're, you know, the, yeah. the angry mob is going through the graveyard. One of the guys actually bumps into a tree, and the tree falls over, because yeah. it's just a prop tree. Yeah. Um, but they... They really were not a part of this. The more like the more you think about it, it's like yeah, they were in the first episode and then they were in the last episode, and it's like, well, they were there, but they they didn't do anything. So yeah. it's like you kind of lose like all th threat threat about them. And just I a, guess. a minor point there: in the first episode, they found one of the exterior suits. You know, one of the yeah. So 
why did the Vord still need their suits on in that last scene? You know, uh, I guess just so you look more menacing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, I mean, just minor things. Uh, although it is interesting that you know it's like okay, they're wearing a suit, but the one, the leader, took Arbitan's robes and put it on. I thought he just put it on just to be a jerk. You know, it's like ah, well now I'm wearing your robes, and then they come in. And he somehow has gotten the hood completely over his helmet. Over his cone head, yes. Yeah. That that was odd. And I'm glad they immediately picked up on that. And then they started questioning about Altos. And so um, that's why Ian gave the fake key. Yeah. Which I'm glad I remember that, too. It's like, oh, yeah, they found a fake key uh, on that one, like, Buddhist statue or whatever. <laughs> um, again, seem more uh, Middle American than Buddhist, but whatever. Uh, yeah, could still. be. Either way. Yeah, so, yeah, the Vords, they, they, they were there. They, I guess I guess it's all right, because, like, all right, you need some sort of threat to set this into motion, but it's like, you'd almost think, like, if they're going there, shouldn't they have people also going after the keys? Because the keys aren't there, you know? Yeah, you would think. Yeah, um, but that that's pretty much all I wrote down. Uh, and by the way, just a minor thing here. For those of you who have been watching, you know that we're in the middle of the whole virus thing, and one of the first things they tell you is, you know, don't touch your face, whatever you're doing. And you probably noticed me, again, uh, scratching my eyes and, and my nose and everything. Please understand, this is Oklahoma in the springtime. And whereas around the world, you know, uh, pollen and allergies are down here in Oklahoma, it's literally up here. So yeah. we are we're dying here, but not of the virus. We're just sneezing and coughing because it's Oklahoma in the springtime. Yeah, it's just it just happens. But we're all right. We're all right. Um, but yeah, that I mean that's pretty much it. That's good to me. These were an interesting set of six episodes. Um, Maybe maybe not as good as Marco Polo was, but they they were interesting. And I'm at least glad that they're varying the sets with each one, you know. Um, because especially, like, when we sat through the Daleks, you know, and we literally sat through all seven episodes in one day, <laughs> that that was a struggle to get through. But at least here, it's like, okay, well, we're going, we're going to different places, you know. We're going to a jungle, then we're going to the mountains with stock footage of wolves, and then we're going to the city. It's all nice, you know. Um, but yeah, that is pretty much that. So, uh, yeah, with all that being said, we're Alex and Dad from 7th Hour Films, and we will see you guys next time. Take care. All right, guys, thanks for watching this video. If you want to watch more of our Doctor Who classic reactions, you can click on the playlist, you can subscribe if you haven't done that already, and be sure you hit that notification bell. You can support me on Patreon and follow me on social media, links below in the description. See you guys later.